So we have Sarah from, um, Sarah Hulls is from the Sales University and her presentation is titled The Grammar of Henry de Lubac's Trinitarian Anthropology. Sarah, please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Oh, great. It's so good to see familiar faces. Um, thank you for having me. Um, this paper actually comes from research for my dissertation. Um, Father Doran was serving on my dissertation board. Uh, he was enthusiastic about the project and he helped me um, get this idea off the ground. So even though I'm writing on Henri de Lubac's Trinitarian Anthropology, Father Doran was involved in this um, in this work in its early stages. Um, so, okay, here we go. <laughs> Although perhaps most widely known for his work on the relationship between nature and grace, French theologian Henri de Lubac devoted much of his theology to exploring the ways that the Trinity sheds light on the meaning of the human person. In light of our conference theme, the interpersonal communion, connection, sorry, human and Trinitarian, as well as the call of Gaudium et Spes and the last three popes to find in the Trinity a model for interpersonal communion. In what follows, I present De Lubac's Trinitarian anthropology um, or the ways in which he sees the Trinity as shedding light on anthropology. I call these ways his Trinitarian anthropological grammar because I am proposing that there is a specific set of rules or principles that de Lubac employs when applying the Trinity to anthropology. I borrow this idea from Louis Ayers, who in his book, Nicaea and its Legacy, shows that before the Trinitarian vocabulary of the early church was fully established, there was nonetheless a certain set of rules or principles that church fathers followed when speaking about the Trinitarian mystery. These Ayers calls a grammar. While de Lubac sees the Trinity as relevant to anthropology, he does not have one specific systematic treatise regarding the way in which the Trinity ought to be applied to anthropology, nor a consistent anthropological vocabulary. Indeed, as David Williams says of de Lubac, quote, a less systematic systematician is difficult to imagine. Uh, however, de Lubac does allude to basic guiding principles um, which I set out to organize and articulate here. These principles are the essence of the grammar that I present to you. They reveal the ways in which de Lubac sees the Trinity as relevant to anthropology and implicitly the ways in which he does not. So grammatical rule one, preserve analogy. The application of the Trinity to the human person must be done so within the confines of the principle of analogy which, in the words of the Fourth Lateran Council, is the notion that, quote, between creator and creature, there can be noted no similarity so great that a greater dissimilarity cannot be seen between them. The Council's declaration was responding to the errors of the abbot Joachim of Fiore, who attempted to speak of the relationship between the Trinitarian persons and human persons in a univocal way suggesting that the unity among the Trinitarian persons is the same as the unity among human persons. The council corrected this error, declaring that the similarities that exist between God and created being always exist within an ever greater dissimilarity. Thus, while we speak of the unity of the Trinitarian persons as reflected in the unity of human persons, based on Christ's prayer that they may be one as we are one, the Fourth Lateran Council teaches that this unity is a similarity that is within an ever greater dissimilarity, as the unity of the Trinitarian persons is one of substance, while the unity of human beings is a unity of charity and grace, not of substance. De Lubac concurs with this principle and indeed writes a two volume tome dedicated to the errors of the Abbot Joachim and shows how these errors shaped Western thought in a negative way direction. At least that's his claim. Okay, grammatical rule two, primacy of theology over anthropology. Second, in applying the Trinitarian mystery to theological anthropology, de Lubac insists on maintaining the primacy of theology over anthropology. He writes in the Christian faith, 
quote, the doctrinal character of faith is not opposed to its existential character. However, the latter always presupposes the former to avoid becoming an illusory dream or an anthropocentric withdrawal, end quote. While anthropological conclusions may be derived from the mystery of God on the basis of our status as image, anthropological considerations should not drive or determine the content of theology from the outset. Rather, Catholic theology, quote, always maintains the primacy of objective being over personal meanings and appropriations, end quote. To demonstrate what he means, de Lubac cites Pierre Rousselot, who captures the movement from theology to anthropology as follows. Christ has two natures. What is that to me? But the substantial reparation of humanity lies in that very fact. But this joining of the divine and the human touches and heals what is most profound and most inalienable in me, my very nature. Christ has two natures. What is that to me? But every living intelligence is directly, personally, profoundly involved in this central fact of the history of being, which brings divinization to creatures. At the moment that affects the depths of being itself, it affects the depths of my own being. Now, de Lubac also praises, quote, those who less concerned about themselves find in the mystery of the Holy Trinity exactly what the church proposes to them in her formulas, the ever and endlessly fruitful, infinitely transcendent, living principle of their own experience. Thus, de Lubac endorses allowing the Trinity to shed light on the meaning of experience, yet the reflection on experience must proceed from the Trinity as revealed by Christ and defined in the church. On this basis, de Lubac rules out changing the names of the Trinitarian persons to better correspond with anthropological ends, as well as changing Trinitarian theology in any way in light of anthropological experiences. The starting point of anthropological investigation should be theology, not anthropology, on de Lubac's understanding. Okay, grammatical rule three. There are in case you're counting down. Uh, grammatical rule three, Christ is our access point to the Trinitarian mystery. So how does one avoid anthropocentric illusions and base one's reflections about the human person on God in himself? Well, the, revolution, the revelation of God's Trinitarian nature comes through Christ. De Lubac explains, it is through the economy and only through it that we have access to theology in the sense of God's own life. The economy provides the foundation of our Trinitarian theology and purifies our concepts of God. This is the way in which de Lubac preserves the priority of theology over anthropology by beginning with what God revealed himself in Christ is recorded in scripture and interpreted through the church rather than merely speculating about God on one's own. Grammar rule four, God is one substance and three persons, a unity in distinction. Traditional theology about God reveals that God is one substance in three persons, which de Lubac describes as a unity in distinction. De Lubac emphasizes the fact that the unity of God is not at odds with the distinction of the persons, nor are the distinctions of the persons dissolved vis-a-vis -vis God's unity. De Lubac writes, quote, God is one, and none of the three divine persons can be conceived in himself or in his operations, as separate from the other two. Still, he conditions this statement with the inverse affirmation. Quote, it is not a God nature that acts, but a tripersonal God whose nature is one. End quote. In sum, de Lubac emphasizes the simultaneity of the unity and distinction within God without privileging one aspect of God's Trinitarian nature over the other. Okay, grammar rule five, unity and distinction in creation is a reflection of the unity and distinction in God. The unity and distinction of the Godhead, which describes the fact that God is one substance and three persons, is reflected in created reality. On the basis of the Trinity being the source of all reality, <clears throat> de Lubac declares, quote, ground of all being is communion, of which components are unity and distinction coexisting. That's his understanding of communion. It's unity and distinction coexisting. 
De Lubac points to several instances of unity and distinction in creation. These include the unity of an organism and its vast complexity of cells, the unity of a team, which is served by the distinction of the players, and the unity of a marriage, wherein the unity of the spouses does not obliterate their distinction but ratifies it. Although these basic observations reveal that a pattern of unity and distinction exists in creation, de Lubac proposes that the Trinity tells us why it exists. He writes, quote, it is faith itself by means of its most hidden mysteries that brings us right up to the truth. For do we not believe that there are three persons in God? It is impossible to imagine greater distinctions than those of this pure threefold relationship, since it is these very distinctions that constitute them in their entirety. And do they not arise in unity, the unity of the one same nature? The most complete expression of personality appears to us thus in the being of whom every being is a reflection, an image, a shadow, a trace, the consequence as well as the consecration of the highest unity, end quote. Um, so on de Lubac's understanding, the revelation of the Trinity sheds a backwards light on the mystery of unity and distinction in creation. Nevertheless, in accord with the first rule, de Lubac conditions this fifth rule by noting that the difference between the Trinity and created being is ever greater than its reflection in created being. He writes, quote, yet observation, whether biological or moral, can only furnish us with analogies. It can discern the truth that we are seeking, but only from afar and does not allow us to state it in its fullness. End quote. The relationship between distinction and unity in the Trinity is, quote, a truth enjoined on us by the twofold converging power of experience and faith yet we can never succeed in grasping it in its ultimate nature, end quote. So while the unity and distinction of our being is similar to that of God's, it is, again, contained within a wider array of dissimilarities. Grammar rule six, person in communion is a reflection of the Trinitarian unity and distinction which grounds it. De Lubac takes the principle of unity and distinction rooted in God and reflected in creation and applies it in a heightened way to the relationship between the person and the whole or community. He writes, when we consider the relations between distinction and unity, we can then also quote, understand the agreement between the personal and the universal. So from the unity and distinction of the Trinity, de Lubac derives two anthropological conclusions. First, Human persons are distinct, irreducible existences, each having innate worth and special dignity. The good of the distinct human person should never be subordinated to some supposedly higher social end. Persons are ends in themselves. In brief, the social good should never contradict the good of the individual person. That said, de Lubac is not advocating for some kind of individualism. So second and simultaneously, human persons are fundamentally social, made from and for others. De Lubac notes that persons discover their own unique identity in and through relationships with others. Anticipating Baltazar's analogy of the newborn baby awakening to self-consciousness in the loving gaze of its mother, de Lubac asks, quote, in the first place, does not one need the other so as to be awakened to conscious life? The psychological truth is a symbol of one more profound. We must be looked at in order to be enlightened. And the eyes that are bringers of light are not only those of the divinity." End quote. But we discover our unique identities in relationships. Further, human persons are also called to make gifts of themselves. To demonstrate this, de Lubac appeals to the etymology of the word person. He writes, quote, does not to be a person, if we take the original meaning of the word in a spiritual sense, always mean to have a part to play? Is it not fundamentally to enter upon a relationship with others so as to converge upon a whole? The summons to personal life is a vocation, that is, a summons to play an eternal role, end quote. The persons are not 
alone in a relationship, according to De Lubac, but rather are constituted by and distinguishable in their relationships, which unite them to other persons. In claiming these two poles, the personal and social aspects of the person as being rooted in the Trinitarian relations, De Lubac anticipates the Trinitarian anthropology of God, he meant 24, a document which he helped to draft. God, he meant 24, reads, um, citing John at first, indeed the Lord Jesus, when he prayed to the Father that all may be one as we are one, opened up vistas closed to human reason, for he implied a certain likeness between the union of the divine persons and the unity of God's sons in truth and charity. This likeness reveals that man, who is the only creature on earth willed for itself, cannot fully find himself except through his sincere gift of self. So on the basis of the Trinitarian communion and the human person's call to grow in likeness to the Trinity, Gaudium et Spes, like de Lubac, simultaneously affirms both the human person's existence as a distinct self and his or her call to communion with others. Um, indeed, the communion with others confirmed by a sincere gift of self is the means by which the distinctiveness of the person becomes clearer. Man finds himself through a sincere gift of self. While de Lubac derives anthropological conclusions from Trinitarian theology, he is once again careful to preserve the ever greater dissimilarity between God and the world and the primacy of theology over anthropology, as per the first and second rules of this grammar. Thus, for instance, in the midst of his anthropological reflections, he reflects again on God, writing, quote, in the one there is no solitariness, but fruitfulness of life and warmth of presence. In the all-sufficient being, there is no selfishness, but the exchange of a perfect gift. From this theological reflection, de Lubac's anthropological conclusion follows, quote, there is no solitary person. Each one in his very being receives of all, of his very being must give back to all. It is like a two-way method of exchange, a two-fold mode of presence. So on the basis of the Trinity, de Lubac makes anthropological conclusions, um, namely that human persons are not isolated individuals, but are fundamentally social, constituted by relationships, while nevertheless remaining distinct within those relationships. Our final grammatical rule is rule seven, persons are called to communion with God. According to de Lubac's Trinitarian anthropology, the Trinity does not only reveal the basis for the right balance between the person and community, it also reveals the supernatural destiny of the human person, namely union with the Trinitarian God, as well as the nature of that union. So refusing to locate the human being's ultimate end in nature itself, De Lubac proposes that supernatural communion with God is essential for realizing full human personhood. Thus, for an anthropology to be adequate, even on the natural level, it must be rooted in and oriented towards supernatural communion with God. De Lubac states, quote, we are fully persons only within the person of the Son, by whom and with whom we share in the circumcession of the Trinity. End quote. The human person in society is called not only to mirror the Trinitarian relations in an analogous way, but also to grow in the likeness of the Trinity itself through communion with God and others. Furthermore, the relationship between the human person and God is analogous to the relationship between the human person and his or her um, social relationships. That is, it also reflects the Trinitarian structure of unity and distinction. So at the level of nature, God is the very ground of the person's distinct existence. Indeed, the distinct person would cease to exist if not held in being by God, which is a kind of unity. At the level of grace, relationship with God also preserves and ratifies the person's distinction on de Lubac's understanding. He writes, quote, it is by calling man that the God who manifested himself in biblical history and who finally reveals himself in Jesus Christ, giving us a simple glimpse of the mystery of his interior life, at the same stroke reveals man to himself, 
It is in this divine vocation that man learns to know himself. God reveals himself to him in a more and more sharply contoured personal form, but also one that is more and more mysterious, whose correlative is the increasing personalization of the one who receives his revelation. God, as Teilhard de Chardin says, is personality personalizing. Henceforward, man, adorer of the divine trinity within which he has been inserted, knows he exists with an existence that participates in God's absoluteness. He is no longer completely immersed in earthly society or in the cosmos. The Christian has received a name, end quote. So in this union with the Trinitarian God, the human person is not absorbed or dissolved in that relationship. Union with God does not require the obliteration of the distinct human being or the person's otherness. Rather, in relationship with the Trinity, the person's distinction emerges to an even more profound degree. Thus, this relationship, like the Trinitarian relations, is a unity in distinction. Now, De Lubac's Trinitarian understanding of the God-person relationship stands in stark contrast to his description of the analogous relationship in Amida Buddhism, wherein the person's union with Amida Buddha ultimately demands that the person's distinction in the relationship be dissolved. Amida Buddha helps the Buddhist believer to reach nirvana, which is the elimination of the distinct self, rather than its ratification or personalization. And Amida Buddha eventually himself dissolves in the face of this end. Um, De Lubach also contrasts this Trinitarian understanding of the God-person relationship with Nietzsche's version of mysticism, which he calls European Buddhism. As De Lubach understands it, Nietzsche's mysticism centers around the eternal return, wherein the distinction of the overman, which is Nietzsche's paradigm of the person, is ultimately dissolved within the greater force of fate. So in contrast to these, a Trinitarian mysticism rooted in Trinitarian anthropology upholds the distinction of the person in relation to God, and the location of this personalization, at least the side of heaven, is the church, which De Lubac calls Ecclesia de Trinitate, Church of the Trinity. So in conclusion, in this paper, I have attempted to organize and interpret disparate aspects of De Lubac's Trinitarian anthropology into what I have called as Trinitarian grammar. These grammatical rules describe De Lubac's own Trinitarian anthropology, but also his vision for how the Trinity ought to be applied to human persons in a theologically healthy way. It avoids, on the one hand, the neglect of the Trinity in anthropological questions, and on the other, the conflation of theology and anthropology in a way that shapes theology through predetermined anthropological goals. In this way, I believe De Lubac's Trinitarian Anthropology is a resource for all those who, seeking to do theology within the Catholic tradition, apply the Trinitarian mystery to the mystery of the human person. Thank you. Wonderful, th Sarah. Thank you very much for sharing your research, but also your, uh, obviously, the guidance from Doran originally and then how he continues to guide you now. Questions, thoughts, reflections, movements from the Trinity. Okay, here they come. Steve, yeah, you wanna go ahead? Thanks, Sarah, it was great. Um, so uh, just maybe a clarification question about kind of how Delulac things sees things. When we're talking about the union, the ultimate union with God, communion with God eschatologically, is that, how does that compare to the, is, is that relationship, that unity, um, the human God relationship at that point, is that unity and distinction still analogous to the unity and distinction between the members of the Trinity, uh, or is it cl is it closer to being univocal with that? Does he get into kind of you know are there different um, gradations of analogy 
um, because it seems like there should be something distinct between our relationship with, you know, um, God here or human human here versus our relationship with God, you know, um, in its fullness. And then um, if you'll uh, allow me a second question, kind of relatedly in that supernatural communion with God, how does he describe human to human relationships at that point when when multiple people are right in that union with God? How does that relate? How does that affect human to human relationships at that point? Um, just any thoughts you have would be appreciated. Thanks so much, Steve. Great to see you. Um, so in terms of both of these questions, as far as I've read so far, um, De Lubac sees um, in heaven both of these relationships between the person and God and, and persons and other persons, the communion of saints, to still be a communion that um, preserves distinction within it. Um, I haven't seen so far more than that description given, but um, I think that he uses this idea to, to criticize um, both Nietzschean mysticism and Buddhist mysticism, um, which he sees as obliterating the person kind of at, at the end of their system, like the, the ultimate goal of nirvana as De Lubac understands it. And as some forms of Buddhism express, it's no self, this doctrine of no self. And so he was really worried about um, two things historically. Um, first, the um, increasing secularization and, and atheism happening in Europe where um, Christians were being swayed by um, atheistic, even Nietzschean philosophy, thinking that the idea of the eternal return um, or, or a world without values was somehow more interesting than what Christianity has to offer. And then they were also being um, swayed, as he understands it, by um, Buddhism. Um, so Buddhism was um, becoming more well known in Europe in the early 20th century, and Christians were um, becoming enamored by it. It was just this thing that was so other. And so given his historical context, what he was focusing on is saying, hey, this Trinitarian religion gives you unity, but yourself is not obliterated in that unity. You don't have to compromise yourself. It's there. And this is there all the way down. We see it reflected in creation, but it's even going to be there um, in, in the communion of saints. Um, now, he does talk about, you know, the, the path from nature to grace, as Balthazar says, and De Lubac expresses it in a similar way, is always through the cross. And the Christian is given a new name, but this new name um, doesn't do violence to um, the really real person, if you will. It's, it's almost like a, a false self, true self kind of thing, like the, the fallen self washes away, but this self that's always been, you know, in Christ Jesus from the beginning of time um, is is what emerges. Um, so God, he would say, because God is love, God doesn't require this obliteration of difference. Um, but again, I haven't seen details more, you know, more details than that. The other thing in the background was modern individualism. And so he was also trying to say that you know, Christians in the early 20th century were obsessed with, or at least perceived as being obsessed with individual salvation. Like, I'm just going to focus on my own salvation. Um, but he, he was trying to bring out, actually, salvation is not simply an individual affair. Um, you're united to other persons in this community of saints, and eternal life is communion. So he had these things going on in the background, if that clarifies, sheds some light. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Others? Joseph, please, yes. Hi, Sarah, nice to see you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, in the light of your response to Steve's question. I don't know a lot about Henry de Lubac, okay? So my question is based more from your response and the backdrop of his position. 
So do you think that in the light of the emphasis on inter-religious dialogue, that Henry de Lubac's position could be reconstructed in any way, especially in the light of the way he looks at other religions? Brother Joseph, so good to see you. Good to um, see you. And, and thank you for that question. Did you say in the light of anti-religious dialogue? In the light of inter, inter-religious dialogue. Inter-religious dialogue. In the light of inter-religious dialogue, um, could De Lubac's um, theology be... The way he looks at other religions, the way his, his view of Hinduism and other religions in the light of the Catholicism of his time, do you think his position could be reconstructed in our own time, especially in view of the emphasis in, on inter-religious dialogue then. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to find a quote here um, that struck me today, actually, is related to what you're asking. Um, so in, I was rereading some of his works on Amida Buddhism today, and he talks about the importance for dialogue um, and even that, um, you know, there are a lot of parallels in Amida, sometimes called Amitabha Buddhism, um, between that and Christianity in terms of how um, um, Amida Buddha is seen as a savior figure and, um, and obviously Christ is as well. Um, and so, uh, he thinks that there's a lot of room for dialogue with Buddhists, um, especially uh, Amida Buddhists on this issue. He thinks that there are a lot of parallels. There's even actually Amida Buddha is said to have had a child, sometimes construed as a male, sometimes a female. Um, the female, it's, its name is Canon. It's been seen as a female in, um, in Japan, and De Lubac draws a connection between canon, the Japanese version of canon, who's this bodhisattva, and the Virgin Mary. Um, they're both called Mother of Grace, um, full of grace. And then Amida Buddha, all you have to say is Amida Buddha multiple times, and Amida Buddha, no matter what your sins are, will deliver you to the pure land in spite of your actions or efforts and what you've done. Um, this, this grace kind of just takes over. And so De Lubac sees a lot of parallels. Um, he does have an evangelical mind. He's always, you know, really trying to evangelize, I think. He says, apologetics is the passion of my life. The defense of our faith is the passion of my life. And so for De Lubac, I think he sees dialogue, um, you know, for better or for worse, I, I think that he sees it as um, something along the lines of not fighting, but, but ar using argument to get to the truth of the matter. And I think that for him, he would ask which religion at the end of the day is, is able to account for the most amount of reality. And, and it's from that, angle that he's holding up Trinitarian faith, saying, look at Trinitarian faith can preserve both unity and distinction of the person. Um, so he is kind of a fighter, I guess, at the end of the day, or an, an apologist. Um, so it depends on which dialogue or which model of dialogue is being used. Does that help? Oh, thanks for your question. Other other thoughts. Well, then, Sarah, a question for you from from me. Uh, well, Peter's just raised his hand. Maybe I'll let him go. Peter. And the analogy of uh, husband and wife. Um, in, in my experience, I, I don't know, I've had this experience, but I had the experience that it isn't just a thought, but it's a reality that the, that the, the husband and wife with the dying Christ 
and the resurrection, there is actually, well, uh, like St. John of the Cross says, a participation through love, only through love, in the, in the nature of God. And we find this. I mean, Jesus said when he was on earth to the Jews, why do you blame me for talking about God, uh, being the son of God, when you yourselves become gods? So there's something very mysterious here in terms of feeling. In, in, in the face of death, Christ's death, our own death, and resurrection, particularly through the experience of marriage, the, the faith and infinite love seem to be a participation in, in the unity and the diversity of, of the Trinity. Uh, does De Lubeck reflect on this at all? Thank you for your um, your comment and your question, Peter. Uh, de Lubac does. So he, um, in his 1938 book, Catholicism, talks about marriage as an image of the Trinity because of that unity and, and diversity within it. Mm. Um, and then he also wrote the foreword to the French edition of Carol Wojtyla's Love and Responsibility. I haven't read it. But he did write the foreword to that, and he and Wojtyla had a dialogue back and forth um, uh, about human love. Um, so, uh, Thank you. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So quickly, I'm wondering if a lot of movement has happened around Doran's, uh, like the, well, I mean, Lonergan's four-point hypothesis and how Doran then took that in the Trinity in history and then drawing out the relations and like making these distinctions of like fraternity, filiation, active and passive spiration. And so someone like Neil Ormerod took it in, in an article, I don't know if you've seen this, it's called um, The Metaphysics of Holiness, where it's like, is there these different manifestations of, of or, or, uh, is the relations, the each and the distinct relations of the Trinity drawn out in, in, con in, in ways that we can actually consciously understand as human persons or that it's manifested in different ways. And I guess I'm wondering if, if de Lubac does it at all or, or does he stay more general in terms of like the diversity of the Trinity or does he bring out as like, here's the like characteristics of like paternity and how we can understand truly God the Father and his relationship to the Son and then reverse that to the Son's relationship to the Father. And like, do we participate or can we participate in unique ways in this diversity of the Trinity? And is that is that a worthwhile pursuit, or is that is it is it just a mystery? And we are we can we accept that? Thanks, Father Chris. Um, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so De Lubac does not develop a Trinitarian theology, um, but he does talk about the dynamics in which um, or through which uh, you know we. Um, the dynamics of like a Trinitarian mysticism. And so he especially focuses on the Holy Spirit as um, being the person who interiorizes um, the work of Christ in us. There's kind of this dynamic where the Father sends the Son, who sends the Holy Spirit, and then the Spirit brings us back, gathers us into the Son, who brings us to the Father. This like, uh, you know, descending and ascending movement, Father, Son, Spirit, Spirit, Son, Father. Um, so the Spirit does the work of inter interiorizing Christ's redemption in us, grafting us onto Christ, who brings us to the Father. Um, but he doesn't get into more specifics than that as far as I've seen. There's no um, extensive Trinitarian theology that he develops. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you, sir. It was, yeah, it's great to have you back at Marquette in a sense. And I know that it's always a home for you here, too. And, and yeah, I'm glad you could participate in this year's Lawning on the Edge. Thank you.